every bill comes due. Every debt must be paid, even the ones you yourself didn't necessarily take out. I think sometimes that the point of high society is merely to get through life without paying one's debts. To society, to the earth itself, there are many amongst the numbered wealthy, those power players, who even think they're beyond the debts they accrue in life, the cut down trees, the poisoned air. But all debts come due in time. Today's story is something of an abstraction though it's also very much real in the universe of the West Side fairy tales. It concerns a group of older folks, the tip-top of society who live on a secluded hill in West Virginia. Despite an all-consuming fire steadily, surely approaching them, they're content to squabble amongst themselves about old feuds and grudges. That is, until one of them finds a seemingly innocuous sign that sets about the events that will bring an end to their little hilltop community. But first, this month's recommendations. This month's literature recommendation is the late Toni Morrison's seminal novel, Beloved. Morrison's moving, horrifying, and ephemeral novel concerns itself with the life of a woman named Seth, and her life both before and after escaping from slavery in Kentucky shortly before the Civil War. The book is... rough, to say the least. It's not an easy read, given the subject matter, which ranges from slavery to gang rape to infanticide, but it is a fair and accurate portrayal of the brutality and continuing indignities of the American slave trade. It's a short, powerful novel you can read over a weekend and an absolute must-read. This month's random horror recommendation is Society. Brian Usna's 1989 film about a boy who discovers his upper-crust family are part of a terrifying cult that cannibalizes the lower classes. Though it starts strong and ends kind of soft, in my opinion, Usna's movie is an amazing example of late 80s practical effects and body horror. It's also a fun ride start to finish, though mileage may vary on the ending. It's available for streaming at least a few places online and definitely worth your time if you're looking for a great, gross-out horror to watch on the weekend. If you'd like to hear me talk more about these recommendations, tune in to the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club, abbreviated HLC, in two weeks. I'll break down the recommendations, tell you a little about their history, and what they mean to me as an artist. The HLC is available free on the regular feed. Now, without further ado, today's story. Best Roses, Manassas, West Virginia. Save for the towers of flame rising in the east, it was an otherwise lovely day. The neighbors, shoved indoors more by the generic heat of June than by the distant and consumptive flame, shook off the noonday dreams of summer and walked outside. Rationed electricity made for bad air conditioning, and so the lot of them lay in the deepest shadows of their great houses, where every wet breath of wind was at least cool by the time it fell across their faces. I've won! I've won! Shelley Masterson called. Her voice was higher, though no less shrill than the cicada calls that had begun to peter out around noon. Mike Sokolov found the outside of his home first holding a hand over his brow and squinting across his lawn to where Shelley stood. Of the two of them, he was both older and younger looking, being 80 and looking 70, where Shelley was very much the opposite. She raised a scrawny arm, oversized leather gardening glove dancing about her wrist, and waved to him. He nodded in turn. What are you calling out about, Shelley? He asked, his mole of a wife, Nancy, not quite stepping out onto the deck beside him. She was low and thick-shouldered. Her expensive octagonal seeing glasses were filthy enough to catch the sunlight in a sort of maté pall that made her look all the more like some blind, subterranean thing. To the chagrin of her husband, and most anybody who took the time to speak with her, the damn things were never clean. Look, Michael, I've won! Shelley yelled again, pointing to the sign beside her with both hands splayed open wide. A practiced gesture for sure. In her heyday of some forty years ago, 
Shelley had been one of those thin-assed blondes turning boards and revealing prizes on big three television game shows. She had married the West Virginia state senator she'd been caught sleeping with in one of Morgantown's seedier motels, and that had been the end of work for Shelley. Big, Ben Masterson, her husband, headed the neighborhood watch but rarely left his house, mostly out of sheer laziness and a general hatred of his constituency, which would, in fact, be nearly the lot of us living in this tiny cul-de-sac on the top of Manassas, West Virginia's Indian Hill neighborhood. It was something we didn't let bother us because, as you should know, that's why we chose to live here, so things wouldn't bother us. That's about the time I stepped outside, cracking my joints and looking around the neighborhood. I waved to Mike and Natalia, which caused Natalia to recede into the house like, well, like a mole. She was never a complicated woman. Mike nodded at me, and then Shelley raised her hand, stepping partially out into the street to see me better. She was my immediate neighbor, and my house was the first in the southern curve of the cul-de-sac, which ended at the very top of the hill and was entered via a winding, tree-lined road that came up the hill from the west. It would then wind down through a few lesser neighborhoods before ending down near town. I've won, Paul, Shelley said. Come look. What did you win? I asked, coming down from my porch just as Natalia poked her mole's face back into the window of their house. The Comely family, Bert and Agatha, had come out onto their front porch as well by now both shading their eyes with two hands and wearing matching linen track suits. The suits, like the people wearing them, were faded and thin, being of baby blue fabric with white accents. The Comleys themselves had powder white hair and dull blue eyes. They were more the color of lab animals than people, but nice otherwise. Look, look, it says, Best Roses, Manassas, West Virginia, Shelley said. She was all but yelling now, ostensibly talking to me but casting her face about the neighborhood and pointing wildly at the sign. I was close enough to see the lettering now, dark and swirling calligraphy on a board made of three stained cherry panels. The post was a length of galvanized steel pipe fixed to the boards with brackets and hammered into the dirt along the front row of Shelley's rose garden. She rested her fingers on it and sighed. It's just so nice to get the recognition I deserve, she said to herself. They really are wonderful roses, Bert said, his arm wrapped around Agatha's waist. Her arm was similarly wrapped around him. Yes, so very wonderful, Agatha said. Okay, but according to whom? The lot of us turned to look across the street at Cap DeMarco, who was standing on his porch. His house was the only other sitting on the throat of the street, directly opposite Shelley's. Despite it being noon on a Sunday, and there really not being anywhere worth going anymore, his hair was slicked back over his head and he was wearing most of a suit, all but the tie, in fact, which meant Cap was pretty much dressed for work. The Manassas Gardening Association, I'm sure, Shelley snapped back at him, raising her chin. Or maybe the Ladies Auxiliary, or the, the Kiwanis, or... Even the the folks at the Neighborhood Association down at City Hall. Or maybe you just put it up yourself, Cap said, leaning over the railing of his house and sticking his own chin out. The rest of the neighbors let out a collected sigh, including myself. This wasn't unfamiliar territory. I would never, Shelley said, fair skin growing a shade more red. What an absurd thing to say, and where would I even get something like it from? Where would anybody get anything from right now? Cap said, slumping a little and pointing to the fire beyond the back row of houses. We all ignored him. You probably had your husband make it for you or something. I laughed at this, despite myself. Big. Ben Masterson was a lot of things, but a capable craftsman he was not. I'd been called over to my neighbor's house by Shelley on perhaps a dozen errands in the forty-some-odd years I'd lived down there, almost always to find Ben cramped up underneath a counter, half-drowning himself with a pipe he'd managed to crack, or trying to hold up a ceiling he'd all but pulled down over his own fool head. Shelley gave me a look, and I held my hands up. 
I really can't imagine Ben doodling all those fine letters there, Shelley, I said, pointing to the calligraphy. That's all. Besides, Patty Domingo has much better roses anyway, Cap continued despite my interruption. All of us looked back at the Domingo house at the far end of the road. Even with the columns of smoke rising into the sky behind it, the roses there almost glowed with a vibrant, scarlet fury. The grass, however, could use a little work. It seemed like John, Patty's husband, hadn't bothered cutting it in a few weeks. Patty Domingo doesn't grow her own roses, Shelley said, hands resting on her hips defiantly. She has her brother-in-law Jorge do it for a song with that landscaping company of hers. There's no, no honor in it. No honor in this war of roses, said Dick Bailey, my neighbor and one of the few people on the street I'd actually consider a friend. Who should say there is honor in war but the honorable? And who should be believed in his honor that is not a winner? For what words may fly from vanquished throats to fall on ears unvanquished? And what pen should find dead hands to make dead thoughts again live? Oh, shut up, Dick, Cap said, and Dick flipped him the middle finger in turn. Dick's husband, Jasper, came up behind him and slapped his wrist until he returned the offending digit to his side. His eyes were terribly red, but he smiled all the same. Hello, Cap, Jasper said, waving. Are we enlivening the neighborhood again today? Look, Jasper, Shelley said, pushing past me to gesture to the sign. I've won. He gave the sign a confused glance and then nodded. How wonderful for you, Shelley, he said, then louder for the benefit of Cap. How absolutely marvelous. Then he smiled at Shelley. Maybe you should ask that uh, husband of yours to loosen up on the rationing a bit tonight, huh? We could all have a little celebration for you and your uh, prize-winning roses. Maybe, Shelley said, and this little tableau of our neighborhood could have gone on forever if the wind hadn't shifted right around then, filling the street with smoke. Mike and his wife disappeared into their house in an instant, not having strayed far from the door in the first place. The Comleys turned on their heels and rejoined hands so that they were once again clasped at the waist. In the thickening smoke, I thought I saw something brown staining the ankles of their tracksuits. But Dick was slapping me on the back and yelling for me to head inside. I gave one last look back at Shelley as she worried over her sign, her prize, watching as she brushed the first errant flakes of ash away and then, choking, ran for the door of her house. It was her damnable beast of a husband that woke me the next day. I was alone when I woke, as I had been for the last decade since Brenda died, but still I groped at the space in my now too large bed where she should have been, where she wasn't. I sighed and got myself out of bed, rubbing my eyes and then my hips when I stood. The sunlight streaming into my bedroom was muddled by the crusting of ash that had come to cover my house in the night. There was the softest haze of smoke, too, though it was much diminished and not enough to cause irritation. It was more of a foul-smelling fog, to be honest, but no more bothersome than that. The banging that had woken me continued, followed now by Big Ben Masterson's insistent bellowing, some accusations of vandalism or the like. I shook my head and went downstairs, picking through the last of my medication for the heart pills that would keep me alive until they ran out and then brushing my teeth with little more than my own spit as water. For fuck's sake, what, Ben? I asked while opening the front door. The noise had continued unabated through the entirety of my diminished morning ritual. Something had finally gotten Ben out of the house and now we all had to suffer, it seemed. I found him, Shelley, and Dick out on the porch. Dick gave me a surreptitious shake of the head when I saw him. The universal sign of, this is just bullshit. Where were you between the hours of 10 p.m. and 3 a.m.? Ben asked without so much as a pleasantry. Minding my own fucking business, probably. I snapped back. Ben, being some six foot six inches high and still weighing over 300 pounds at 60, turned an uglier shade of purple. This is not 
a laughing matter, Paul, Ben said, pointing a sausage of a finger at my chest, but not going so far as to poke me with it. A smart move on his part, though he might not have known it. There has been an act of unthinkable vandalism in this neighborhood overnight. He pointed to his own front yard, where I could see Shelley's prize for her roses no longer stood. The roses themselves were still there, pink and white and red all over, but not the sign. It lay in the middle of the street, shattered into pieces, a set of three traffic cones with some caution tape surrounding it. A crime scene, I thought, chuckling to myself. What is so funny? Ben said. I'm sorry, I said. Did somebody break Shelley's sign? How did you know that? Ben said, stepping back and crossing his arms. Relax, Columbo, I said, holding up a hand. I can see it right there. I pointed and everybody followed my finger with their eyes but Dick, who mouthed an I'm sorry to me and then shrugged. Why'd you cover it in crime scene tape? Is it not the scene of a crime? Ben snapped, turning to me. The man had at least six inches and 150 pounds on me, but it didn't much faze me. I don't know what happened to the sign, I said. Do you think I did it? I was sleeping last night, so was everybody else in the neighborhood. There was an ash storm. You'd have to have a pretty decent respirator to go out in it. Ben stared at me, thinking for a long time before nodding. Like an oxygen tank? He asked. Sure, I said. He nodded and slapped a big hand on my shoulder. Then I'm sorry for bothering you, he said, turning and almost immediately screaming for Captain Marco to come outside and show yourself. I blinked and looked to Dick, who opened his mouth, thought twice about whatever he was about to say, and then gestured for me to step back inside my house. He followed me in and closed the door a bit behind him. Ben was already storming across the cul-de-sac toward Cap and Donna's house. Somebody broke Shelley's sign, Dick said, not including one of his usual poetic flourishes. The bags under his eyes made him look almost ghoulish in the dim light of my house. The smoke clouds were so close now, the sun only shone through the windows in the latter part of the day. What a travesty, I said, yawning and watching Ben hollering at the closed and quiet front of the DeMarco household. It reminded me of decades before the fire started, when the two of them used to holler at each other that way in public during election season. Now we alone stood in Ecclesia for them. Do you have any water? Dick asked, looking around the house. I perked up at this. Plenty to share, I guess. Don't you have any? I asked. Jasper uh, took a bath last night, and now we're low, he said, coughing and pointing to my kitchen. In here, I'm sorry for rushing you. I just haven't had anything to drink for a while. I nodded and followed him to my sink, listening to the thrum of the underground pump I'd rigged together pumping up water from the steel cistern buried in my backyard. Dick's hands were shaking as he filled up the glass. How's Jasper? I asked. He took a long drink of water and then filled another glass. His face almost immediately broke out into a sweat and I realized just how thirsty the man had been. He set the glass down after the third and leaned his back against my countertop, sighing. He's been pretty down the past few weeks, you know, he said. The fires and all the, the smoke, it's been getting to him, but I, I think he's in a better place now. He nodded and picked up the empty glass. I saw him watching the beads of water slipping down the smooth sides to puddle at the bottom. Then he drank those as well. How much water do you have left? He asked. I smiled. Do you really want to know? I replied. He shook his head, opening his mouth to say something else. But just then, Ben's shouting hit a fever pitch. We both looked to my front door and then we were through it and outside watching with most of the rest of the neighborhood as Ben and Cap circled each other in the street. You son of a bitch, Ben said. You jealous little shit. He was holding the steel signpost in his hand like a club, poking it at Cap's chest between words. Cap just sneered at him, looking as ever like a weasel slipping around the world in stolen skin. 
Fuck you, Ben, he said. Looking for a fucking scapegoat as usual. Forty fucking years we spent at the Capitol and you're still using your one fucking trick. What, we're up here on Indian Hill now and you can't find any goddamn blacks or immigrants now, huh? Fucking junkies and everybody else, the the fucking welfare queens and the queers are all out there in the fire, so all you have left to blame for shit is the last liberal politician in West Virginia. Still here, Dick offered, rolling his eyes at Cap and raising a hand. And still queer. Shut the fuck up. Both Cap and Ben said, turning to Dick for just a second before turning back to each other. More like you don't have anybody to hide behind anymore, Ben said, poking Cap square in the chest this time and knocking the smaller man back a few paces. Every goddamn election you towed out some new fucking handout orphan of the universe and beg and plead, Oh, daddy government, won't you spare some fucking cheese for these poor what-the-fucks we've forgotten as a society? Cap slapped the stick away, but Ben kept pointing it at him, fully red in the face now. Then you'd get what you want half the time and fuck if I ever saw you solve a single goddamn problem with all that sympathy, Ben said, spitting on the ground. Shelly came out of her house then, wearing a dress nice enough that I figured it was what she was planning to put on for the, now cancelled, Best Roses Party. Stop it! She shouted. Her voice was thin and reedy. The dress had been tailored in a time before rationing, and so hung off old shoulders gone stickish from malnutrition. Still, she retained some of the old senator's wife's vigor and managed to shut up the two old men circling each other in the street. She walked past them and gathered up the pieces of her best roses, Manassas, West Virginia sign, tucking them under her arm and returning tearfully to her home. Ben opened his mouth to say something else, but thought better of it, turning to go inside himself. Bert and Agatha Comley, intertwined and wearing the same powder blue jumpsuits as the day before, the most certainly more stained now, stopped him. They spoke in almost perfect union, smiling and interlacing their fingers. We're sorry, but our rations are running low, they said. Can we have some more food? We're getting awfully hungry. Ben looked them over, not quite able to conceal his discomfort at talking to them. I didn't blame him, the Comleys had always bothered me as well. Shelley, he started, coughing and clearing his throat. He wasn't the only one. The Sokolovs had barely bothered to leave their porch because of the thickening smoke. If the display in the street hadn't been the only distraction I would likely have had that day, I would have gone inside as well. Given that I only had a few dozen books left, most borrowed from Dick, I figured a good old-fashioned street fight was the best water to stretch the milk, so to say. Shelley wanted to come by and say thanks to everybody, Ben continued. He turned to stare hard at Cap for a second. Everybody. For being so supportive when she won the Best Roses Award. Cap rolled his eyes. She was going to bring out some rations to house by house. I guess she's still going to, I don't know. The Comleys shared a look and then turned back to Ben. Are you sure you wouldn't mind coming out? They asked. Ben blinked, sucking his teeth for a second. Shelley said she'd do it. He replied in a flat voice before turning and heading inside. The Comleys made as if to protest, but the wind picked up and soon we were all scrambling to get inside our respective homes and out of the smoke. I had to wrap my face in my shirt to get an honest breath that was so bad. Dick tried to say something to me before we broke apart, but I couldn't hear him. This time, with the smoke, came the sound of the distant and roaring fires, growing, eating, devouring everything. I dreamt of Brenda again that night and, again, as always, woke to the same half-cold and lonely bed. I ran my hand over the smooth covers on her side and then looked out the window to the haze in the middle of the street to the little traffic island in the center of the cul-de-sac and the dead garden in the middle of it. Some people fear nightmares, but I find dreams to be the most cruel. Only in dreams can I again taste the sweetness of youth, 
and the promise of a long life to come. All the viciousness of existence is ahead of a childish and blithely ignorant me, instead of behind the jaded and bitter old man that I am. In my dream, I sat beside my wife in the cul-de-sac, building a fence as she built her rose garden. But I awoke without her, as I said, and again to all manner of caterwauling out in the street. I stood and looked down from my window, seeing the scattered dirt across the ash-grayed street and the gathered crowd of my remaining neighbors. Ben, again circling his ancient nemesis and perhaps the only man on the street who might consider Ben as his best friend. The Comleys weren't there, and the Sokolovs hadn't made it past their front porch, as usual. But Dick was standing beside the men and urging them to stop. I couldn't hear anything intelligible, but the body language spoke clearly enough. I sighed and went through my morning routine, knowing the fracas would still be there when I finished. And I was right. Tell me what you're up to, you bastard! Ben screamed. Both he and Cap had their hands on the broken signpost this time. Incredibly, Cap's wife Donna was out in the street now, holding her oxygen mask over her face and looking at the odd addition to the grass in her front yard. A portion of the lawn had been dug up and replaced with Shelley's now broken, though still exquisite, roses. But the addition that most caught Donna's eye, I saw, was not the new roses but the fresh sign planted in the dirt in front of them. A sign that read, Best Roses, Manassas, West Virginia. God damn it, why the fuck would I steal your roses and then put them in my own front fucking lawn, Ben? Cap yelled. Why the fuck do you do anything? Anything you do, you bastard! Ben screamed back. Because you're trying to take what's mine. Hand in my fucking pocket. You're Damn shovel in my fucking yard! Ben took a step forward then and raised the tip of the broken sign's post, really just a bit of metal pipe, as I said before, and I'm not sure if he would have swung in Cap or not. It certainly seemed like he might have, but he froze mid-swing when Cap pulled a pistol out of his waistband and pointed it square between Ben's eyes. Dick gasped. My God, he added, stepping back and looking at me. I shrugged. Not another step, Ben, Cap said slowly. He moved his thumb to cock the charging hammer on the back of the gun, but there wasn't one on that model, just smooth black plastic. Maybe only I noticed. I'll shoot. Fuck you will, Ben said. Where's all your fucking anti-Second Amendment talk now, you son of a bitch? Man has the right to defend himself, Cap said tilting his chin up and holding the gun out in front of him. The weight was too much for his arm, and he slowly pulled it back to his hip. The man's confidence had only just outgrown his arm strength, it seemed. Ben snarled at him and swung the pipe without even putting a backswing on the stroke. A simple sort of lacrosse flick aimed right at Cap's wrist. Cap's eyes widened at the sudden movement, and he pulled the trigger causing the gun to make a single, soft click before the much louder crash and crunch of the pipe hitting his fingers and sending the pistol flying toward Donna. She yelped through the yellowed plastic of her oxygen mask and stepped aside, though the gun had already fallen to the ground a good three feet to her left. Got you now, Ben hollered, swinging the pipe back toward Cap's face like a sword and just barely missing. The next swing missed similarly, as did the third and fourth. Cap rolled and twisted and slipped his way around the cul-de-sac until something, God knows what, but it was damn loud, popped in his hip and stood him up so straight he looked freshly electrocuted. Had he been a younger man, Ben might have closed the mere five or so feet between them in an instant and brained Cap to death right there, but swinging that heavy metal pipe had all but gassed him and so he settled for slumping to his knees and striking Cap across the back. Cap howled and spun perfectly around the axis of his now unbendable right hip, clutching that and not seeming to care much for the fresher wound on his back. As it stood, the only damage I could see was the fat black stripe of dirt the pipe had left on his shirt. Damn fine hit, you animal, 
Mike Sokolov shouted from his porch. I looked up just in time to see him shake his head and disappear back into the house. Ben was resting on his knees, the pipe between his hands on the pavement. Cap had forgotten the fight entirely and was now screaming about his busted hip. Ben remained red-faced and intent on hitting, possibly killing, his neighbor with the pipe. You son of a bitch, he muttered between wheezing breaths. Cock shit, fuck! Cock shit! Cock shit, fuck! Cap screamed, only now looking down at Ben and trying to push himself a little further away with his still functioning left leg. Ben reared up and smashed the pipe a good ten inches left of Cap's ankle. Fuck off, you bleeding cunt! Just then, Dick grabbed my arm and pointed across the street at Donna. She'd picked up the pistol from the grass and was now leaning over her four-poster walking cane, struggling with feeble arms to cock back the slide. I could see the trace work of her biceps working beneath the liver spots and iridescent blue veins. The black plastic pistol fought her every step of the way, but eventually there was a click and a snap and the gun's return spring kicked the slide forward over the barrel. She nodded with some satisfaction and pointed the thing at Ben, whom Dick and I were standing just on the other side of. Fuck, Dick said, grabbing me just as I started pulling him. I didn't say anything, just watched as Ben reared up like some great, fat, ancient mixture of Moby Dick and Ahab, the post of the ruined Best Roses sign flashing in the scant light of the midday sun. Then Dick reversed direction and pushed me over onto the ground just as Donna aimed the gun and fired. The gun outshone Big Ben Masterson for just a second as the loudest goddamn thing in Indian Hill. I've heard people say you can't see bullets moving through the air because of the speed, and my scientific mind would beg to agree. But damn, if right then I didn't see a black shadow flick off the ground beside Ben and bury itself right in the side of the fat man's belly. Chips of shattered asphalt were still clattering over the ground when he fell onto his right side to join Cap and moaning in the middle of the road. Dick and I pushed ourselves up on our elbows to see if Donna would fire another shot but she just looked at the pistol once and then tossed it away. Oh, goddamn cunt motherfucker, Cap said. Cock fucking shit monkeys, Ben said. They went on like that for a while, so I won't bore you with more. Dick and I dusted ourselves off and stood, which was harder for me than I like to admit. The tumble had hurt my hip, something fierce. Bad enough, at least, that I immediately felt a kinship with Cap as he rolled around on the ground. You damn idiots, Donna said, making her way over to her husband and Ben, dragging her oxygen tank along on a cart behind her. She poked Ben and then Cap with her steel four-poster cane, calling them all sorts of names and admonishing both for making her have to go and shoot that fat idiot in his fat fucking guts. I took the opportunity to slide past them and retrieve the pistol. Donna saw me do so and shrugged. Better you and anybody else on the street, she said, beginning to wheeze between words. She gave Ben a last pop in the head, not enough so that he even noticed, and bent over Cap to see if he was okay. Dick, being the only person left on the street, attended to Ben flipping him over on his back and checking out the wound site. I wouldn't necessarily agree, I said to Donna, holding the pistol gingerly and then offering it to Dick. He made a disgusted face and wiggled his fingers at it, so I shrugged and tucked it into my waistband after taking out the magazine. I put that in my pocket after thumbing over the little brass nuggets that were the bullets. Odd how much damage such little things could do. Where's our goddamn wife? Ben asked, sobbing. Dick looked up at me and then around the yard. It was strange she hadn't come out during all that. I'm not sure, Dick said. I was asking them, Ben shouted, howling in pain with the effort of yelling and clutching the tiny, bloody hole in his shirt. Blood spread there, but it wasn't terrible. Dick had his hand over the wound. 
The hell do you mean, you idiot? Cap asked. He'd gotten to his feet and was now standing with his weight only gingerly on his right hip. It wasn't broken then, I thought, but something bad had happened. She left after the smoke died down last night to come to your house with rations, Ben said through gritted teeth. To all of your houses. She was going to, to apologize for me yelling at y'all yesterday. He sniffed. She never came back. And then I woke up to her goddamn roses in your goddamn lawn. Ben sat up and pointed at Cap, who just shook his head. She did come by, he said, all the fight now gone out of him. Said all that and then left for the Sokolov's place. And that was the last we saw her. Ben opened his mouth, but Cap stopped him by pointing. I'm not lying, and you damn well know that. You've been calling me on every fucking lie I've ever told for most of our lives, Ben. I know you know when I'm telling the truth. Ben just laid his head back and wept. All of us looked away from him, giving him that, at least, when we couldn't give him much else. But where our eyes fell was on the smoke and the belching fire just beyond the pale of the valley, where it rose now from the boiling lakes and rivers of Manassas, where it rested, or maybe had already died on the distant peaks, glutted on timber that had grown all our lives and in the lives of all those who had come before us. As I watched the somber clouds filling the sky more so than the sky itself could fill the horizon, I thought perhaps the fire had reached down into the heart of the mountains themselves, creeping through every run and pit down to feed on the coal there so that the blaze might never die. Hey, Sokolov, I called to the empty porch of Cap and Donna's neighbors. It lay darkly beneath the front eaves of the house and still darker inside only the soft orange twinkle of firelight glowing in the glass. Dick and Cap helped Ben to his feet, Dick running off to his house real quick to fetch some bandages and the like. I crossed the cul-de-sac to the Sokolov's front porch and knocked, waiting a while before trying a second time, then a third, a fourth, nothing. I held my ear to the door and heard little, save some rhythmic sort of noise, a scratching sound or the like though it was deep in the house. Then the doorknob clicked and the front door swept open, revealing Sokolov's dark eyes and the barest planes of his face. The interior was terribly dark, so that I expected one could easily lose themselves in the depths of that place, given there were no candles or electricity or any other light sources, save the cloud-befouled sky. What? he asked, blocking the door as though I had any chance of seeing inside. I apprised him of the situation, and he told me Shelley Masterson had come by, showing me the tin of eaten rations. Then she left for the Comley house. He wiped his nose, smearing what looked to be dirt across the back of his hand. When you go there, tell those perverts we can smell the stink of their home when we try to sleep. Then he shut the door, and I turned around to see my neighbor standing behind me. Cap was walking without support, despite his bad leg and Ben was leaning so hard on Dick that the smaller man seemed about to break at the waist. His face had broken out in a sweat. To the Comleys, then, I guess, I said, and a lot of them shrugged. The cul-de-sac at large was silent, though the fog of smoke rising up the hills below made its own sort of visual noise. The fires still raged, of course but the sound now was as dead to me as the rush of wind through the trees was in better times. For better or worse, we often forget the presence of the things most common to us. Thinking of this, I looked to the dead garden in the middle of the cul-de-sac, and then at nothing at all. How's your husband? Donna asked Dick as we walked. He frowned and then smiled, so subtle a gesture it may not have happened. Fine now, I think, Dick said. Though he's been in a bad way recently, I think he's better. The man is perfected. I thought he made a sad sort of noise then, but also he was adjusting the great bulk of the sweating, bleeding Ben up onto his shoulder, so perhaps it was only that 
I heard. Donna patted his hand. Is that plath? She asked. Now and forever, he said simply, letting the conversation trail to nothing. The smell Mike Sokoloff had urged me to reprimand the Comleys about was well present when we, well, I, ascended the stairs to their front porch. The Comley family lived in the nicest house on the block, second only behind the Walther Manor at the head of the cul-de-sac a divide of quality they would never make up for no matter how many garish and unnecessary additions they slapped onto the sides of their old home. I looked at the Walther Manor just then, before knocking, in an attempt to hide the fact that I was taking a breath ahead of the door opening. It stood as it always had since I'd lived on the street, ominous and tall and dark and yawning empty as a hungry mouth despite being ever closed. There was not a soul on the street who hadn't seen the name Walther on one or more of their checks. Not a soul still who hadn't funneled or cashed or otherwise fulfilled those debts through the Comely family's bank. But old man Walther hadn't stepped foot in the house or on the cul-de-sac itself since long before the fires started burning. Since long before that first spark out on the coast and the roaring, gushing, tearing rush inward that had devoured, would devour, the lot of us. Yes, they asked, startling me so badly I nearly reached for the pistol, an instinct I had thought entirely alien to me until the second it moved in my hand. I blinked, I swallowed, and I tried not to breathe. The smell was really quite terrible there, the only explanation coming to mind that their septic system had befouled itself somehow. There had been similar close calls amongst the others in the neighborhood that I had been called out to fix. The Comleys knew this and had never been the type to not ask for help whether they deserved it or not, so I figured it must be something else entirely and pushed the smell from my mind. We're looking for Shelley Masterson, I said. She was supposed to have come around here last night with rations. The Sokolov said. Sokolov said what? They spat back, their queer pale eyes narrowing in unison. Their home was far less dark than the Sokolovs, though I could no more see inside it for them both standing in the door, clasped at the waist as always. That Shelley had come here after dropping rations at their place, I said, smiling and showing more teeth, perhaps, than necessary. Is there something else they might have said? They sighed and looked at each other. The Sokolovs are nosy. They said, Not as nosy as the Ashley family, thank God. The lot of us looked across the street at the pile of ashes between the Walther Manor and Dick's house. They were both journalists when they still lived in the cul-de-sac, though God only knows where they might be now. The fire that had burned their home had come before the great blazes now filling the horizon, but it had burned all the same. Now nothing was left save bones. In any case, she dropped off her collection of rations and left, the Comleys said. They both gave Ben a pointed look. She stayed a long while to apologize for your behavior the day previous. We had tea. Then she left. They stepped back and began closing the door. Check the Domingo residence. Maybe they've seen her. Then the door clicked shut and the Comleys were gone. I sighed and stepped quickly off the porch. Glad to be quit of the stink of the place. I guess we check the Domingo's place then? Dick asked. I nodded and our little caravan set off again, a touch deeper into the cul-de-sac. The Domingo house stood at the furthest end of the cul-de-sac, only the old abandoned Walther place being any further, and so the building itself stood darkly against a backdrop of rolling white-black smoke and fire. The flames were hot enough to feel, though perhaps they always had been, and a lot of us were dabbing our foreheads with shirt sleeves and the like. The light of the fire filled all the spaces in the house in a way that seemed to leave them more lightless than true dark might, shining through the rear windows and falling out the front windows and spilling to pool amongst the flower-burdened branches of Patty Domingo's rose garden. Really the best in Manassas, West Virginia, if you'd have asked me right then. 
Despite how overgrown the bushes were, badly trimmed and supporting a few wilted blooms here and there, they were still majestic. The roses were fatter than Shelley Masterson's by a degree. They might even have given my late wife's roses a run for their money when she was still growing them, at least. Only Donna seemed distracted by them, adjusting herself and her oxygen tank to rest a finger at the bottom of a petal and pushing the rose fully to her face. She pulled aside her mask and breathed deeply from the cup, staying that way for a long moment before coughing a few times and returning her mask. She saw me watching and shrugged and smiled. How often do we stop to do that? She asked me. I nodded. Dick was already up on the porch with Ben, setting the man in a porch swing hung from the overhang with steel chains. They groaned, but held. I looked at the man himself, who seemed a bit pale. His eyes wandered over the roses in the yard, but I don't think he was seeing much of what he looked at. His face was blotchy red and flecked with sweat. Patty, John, you in there? Dick asked, repeating the words in a yell when he didn't get an answer. Donna sat down beside Ben and rested a hand on his shoulder, which he rested his fingers on in turn. Dick looked at me. You think we should go in? I shrugged. The others remained silent. I think we should go in, Dick said finally, turning to the door and patting around the frame. Eventually, he came up with a small, copper-colored key that slid right into the deadbolt. He turned it and then opened the door onto a pitch-black foyer. How did you know that was there? I asked him. I'm nosy, was all he said. Only Cab hobbled into the house along with us, sputtering curses like a bad seal on a steam tank. Dick fumbled around in the dark for a while and then I heard the snap of a flint wheel. There was a light in the room, fluttering dimly over the walls from a half-burned candle in Dick's hand. I looked at it, and then at him. There's a few more on the shelf right there, he said. I've seen them burning here before, but not for a few days. Maybe a week. I thought they'd just run out or something. He shrugged. The light on his face looked eerie. Grab yourself one and we'll search the house real quick. Search the house? I asked. If they were, I don't know, around, if that was the case, they would have said something to us already. And maybe they're sleeping. Maybe they're trapped under a mountain of fallen newspapers in the basement. Who knows? He started walking deeper into the house. I'll check the first floor and you go upstairs. I nodded and got to it, taking the broad wooden staircase beside the front door up to the second level. John Domingo had legitimately ruined his knee slipping down an embankment at the golf course in White Sulphur Springs, and so handicap accessibility hardware seemed to sprout from every surface, like some polished steel and plastic parasite. The flame from my candle danced over the well-oiled and maintained oak paneling beside the staircase and also reflected brightly off the dozens of silver screws that had bolted a newer, sturdier handrail to the wall. The handrail, in fact, started at the base of the stairs and filled every wall on the second floor, like some broken, alien monorail that glowed just a touch brighter than all the rest of the interiors. I checked everywhere, but found nothing on the second floor. About ten rooms, most cordoned off with weather plastic to keep the heating bill down, and only one showing any sign of habitation. Their bedroom, of course, and the adjoining bathroom. In this one room, more than any others, the candle wasn't completely necessary. The light of the fires filled the room with orange light that held steady, in counterpart to the inconsistent yellow flicker of the candle flame. Its only use here was to penetrate the deepest shadows, in the closet, behind the shower curtain, under the bed. A single, dusty slipper under the bed, lost for how inconvenient it might have been for the Domingos to retrieve it, was all I found. I sighed and turned to the windows overlooking their backyard. Their land, as I understood it, likely ran a good ways down through the woods on the back end of the mountain on which our little Indian Hill neighborhood had been built. The yard itself was tidy, mostly plant beds and a few ornamental trees, and then a fence and the thick expanse of old Appalachian forest beyond. And, beyond that, the fire. 
It was close now. Closer than I ever expected to see it, though I'd known for a while it would come. Perhaps a hundred meters, maybe twice that, I, I couldn't really tell. The flames rose in a massive column. A wall so wide it obstructed the view of the lower valley behind it. I shook my head and rested my forehead on the glass, which was terribly warm to the touch, and closed my eyes. We'd known it was coming for a long time. I'd known better than anybody else for the most part, though there was little in the way of anything done about it. Oh, people complained and all that. Cap was particularly fond of touting out his knowledge about the impending collapse, but mostly because Ben's position was that it wouldn't, couldn't, ever come. The rest of the neighborhood fretted about in their way, but nobody ever did anything. No hard action, no decisive strike. We just sat about and waited. And now it was here. I opened my eyes and looked down at the yard again, at all of Patty's wonderful plants already starting to brown and wither in their gardens. It was a shame that honest work would all go to rot soon, but what didn't? Looking down and pondering all that, I noticed something odd. A bit of weirdness in one of the well-coiffed bushes just beneath the window. Like a sort of depression, and then again, something else. I went down the stairs in a hurry, finding Dick just as he was coming up out of the Domingo's basement. Ben and Donna had moved inside and were sitting at the living room table with Cap, sharing drinks from a jug of water the Domingo's had left out on the counter. There's no food left in here, Ben said, his words a dull whisper. His face was terribly pale now, almost completely white. They haven't gotten anything to eat from me in a while either. Maybe they left, Dick offered. I couldn't find anything on this floor or in the basement. All the um, newspaper piles are still standing straight where John left them. He looked at me. Anything upstairs? No, I started. But there's something odd in the back garden. Can you come check it out with me? We headed out back and it was immediately obvious something terrible had happened. The bush I had seen was smashed in as though something terribly heavy, a person perhaps, had fallen fully into it. Branches were smashed and snapped clean off in places. Dick bent into the plant and pulled up a single stick covered in old blood. He held it out to me and I took it, then leaned down and held my candle into the shadow of the destruction. Jesus, Dick said. I repeated the casual blasphemy sweeping the candle back and forth to get a better look. Dried, tacky blood filled the space, and even though it was dry, you could still smell it clear as day. I pushed my fingers into the soil and pulled up a reeking lump of dirt, rubbing it between my fingers. We looked around and saw more. Streaks dried here and there on the siding of the house and, following the trail further, on the gate leading out of the backyard. Dick called the others out and showed them what we'd found. Their reactions were mostly indistinguishable from ours. Only Donna started crying. Cap wrapped an arm around her, stifling a hiss when the movement aggravated his bad hip. She patted his arm and rubbed her face dry on his shirt. Do you think it could be Shelley? Ben asked. His face was screwed up with worry, but he was keeping it together as best he could. I don't think so, I said pointing back at the bush. All the broken branches are completely browned. Whatever happened there happened at least a few days ago. God, while we were all out having that stupid fucking argument in the street, Cap said, what the fuck is going on in this neighborhood? What the fuck could have happened here? I don't know, Dick said, pushing the wooden gate open and stepping into the side yard. But I'll tell you there's more blood out here, and it leads right to the Comley's back door. The air in the Comley's backyard was barely breathable, full of whatever it was in their house that stank so badly and more so the choking smoke of the burning hillside below. It was apparent that, no matter what we found, there was little time left to live in the neighborhood. Jesus Christ, Dick said leading the way through a thicket of spruce bushes that had once been cut into tidy geometric shapes. 
Between the lack of trimming and the browning effects of the fire, the things looked like balls of rust. We found our way to where Dick stood alone on the house's rear patio, a sweeping disc that lay flat over the hill behind us. I'd been there before. Probably everybody in the neighborhood had at one time or another for parties and the like, though we were never all invited together. The Comleys were like that. The far end of the disc had crumbled from heat and looked for all the world like a great gray cookie with a bite out of it. Even as I looked at it, the platform gave a brittle crack and more slid down into the fire below. The noise of it startled me almost as much as Donna's wheezing scream. She'd followed Dick through directly me holding the nasty branches of the bushes aside for her. Ben and Cap were behind me, leaning on each other now that both of them could barely walk. Cap helped Ben against the wall, where the larger man slid down to lay on the concrete, and then stepped up beside his wife. He held a hand to his mouth and then looked away. It was bones, I saw, and some other human detritus piled into a blue plastic bucket. The kind you could get from any hardware store. Half a skull lay atop the pile of larger bones, all broken neatly in the centers, its black hollow of an eye catching only some of the firelight now bathing all of us. Mixed in with the larger items were other things, torn shreds of human clothing and even long, clotted lumps of human hair. I took a breath and picked the bucket up, walking to the edge of the broken patio. What are you doing? Dick asked, the other's eyes repeating the question. I said nothing and looked down into the fire. The heat was terrible. Terrible. I tipped the bones over the edge and watched them disappear without fanfare. The flames didn't care what mixed in with their meal. Better that than this bucket, I said, returning to the others. Dick opened his mouth to protest. Look, I interrupted. Nobody's coming. Nobody's even left. He swallowed and looked past me to the fire, maybe thinking of his own place in it. That was Patty Domingo's shirt in there, Donna said. I turned to her, expecting to see her look at me, or Dick or the others. Maybe down at the ground, I don't know. What she was looking at were the four blue eyes of the Comleys, who stood in the dark entryway of their house, arm in arm. Even as I watched, they stepped back into the darkness only their eyes remaining to be seen, and then not even that. This can't stand, Ben said, pushing himself to his feet. Where the hell is Shelley? He was talking, it seemed, to the ground. Blood now covered all of his lower belly and had crept down the interior leg of his pants. His face was drawn, deflated. Blue bags hung beneath his eyes. God damn it, he said, almost crying. Where's my wife? With a speed I'd never expected of the man, even at his prime, Ben shoved himself off the wall and turned into the house. Donna gasped and called for him, then for her husband as well when Cap barreled into the house behind the larger man. Then Dick was running into the house and me behind him, pulling Cap's gun from my waistband and shrugging at a confused and, honestly, terrified Donna as I ran inside. The house was terribly dark and lit only by the ugly orange light of the fire and a smattering of votive candles I knew, for sure, didn't belong to the Comely family. I picked up one reading Nino de Antocha, and Dick grabbed one reading Virgin de Guadalupe. Of the two, that one I understood the translation for. We walked deeper into the house, waving the candles around to beat back the darker shadows in the corners. We found nothing interesting save some plates and a gas grill set up in the kitchen. Five places had been set at the table, and every plate was still dirty with some sort of brown sauce. The worst of the bad smell in the house wasn't here, however. It quite clearly came from the open downstairs doorway at the far end of the house. Steady, yellow electric light poured up from down there to shine on the ceiling and the plush Middle Eastern carpets adorning the comely living room. Ben huffed over that way, pawing sweat off his head and mumbling something under his breath. Cap caught up with him, speaking sense to the best of his ability and doing nothing to stop the sweating, bleeding bull of a man from storming toward that doorway. He stopped him right at the edge, however, and Dick and I caught up, both looking down there into the rough shadows at the bottom of the stairs. 
You're almost in no condition to use stairs, Cap said. Why don't you let the others go down first, huh? Ben slumped against the wall and shook his head. Fine then, he muttered. His voice was barely there anymore, but he continued in a soft whisper. I knew them. What is all this? I had the honor of the first descent. The shitty little plastic gun held out at arm's length in a way I'd only ever seen in movies. The stairs were firm but felt unsteady all the same because of how bad my legs were quaking. Then I was at the bottom, standing on smooth stone and holding my votive candle out underneath the gun. It was all quite terrible. The Comleys had done a good enough job of corralling the blood off their makeshift butcher's table into a series of mostly full buckets at the foot of the thing. Still, plenty more had dripped from the edges or splattered out against the wall. There was a place as well to the side of the buckets where they had hanged our neighbors before slitting them like pigs. The blood there, the lion's share of it, so to say, had been caught in a big pink plastic storage box labeled Hanukkah. An assembly of ornaments I knew to belong to that holiday lay in an out-of-the-way pile beside the staircase. What was left of Shelley lay on the butcher table. I could see only her hair. The body itself was on its belly with her face away from me, but that was enough. Her skin had been flayed away piecemeal and hung in strips on a rack against the far wall, where a chugging generator powered the basement lights. Some of the skin remained still on the hands and feet, the frontward sections of her body, but largely only the deeper flesh remained. Often not even that. Sections of her thighs and calves were gone, along with both shoulders and all of her ass. I could see the plastic and steel fixtures in her hip where a broken section had been replaced years ago, now laid bare beneath the heartless yellow lamps of this butcher's kitchen. I turned to the others, strewn out along the stairwell, Ben at the topmost step and tried to tell them not to come downstairs. Then, Bert Comley stabbed Ben in the side of the throat flitting out of the darkness beyond the electric lights like a specter. His eyes were as simple, as dull, as ever, though slightly wider. Even from down here, I could see the tendons on his scrawny wrist flexing as he pushed the knife through the front of Ben's throat, cutting through the trachea, the veins, everything. Blood bubbled out of Ben's mouth, and he gave a single, confused look down at the rest of us before turning with a mad ferocity and grabbing Bert by his face. They tumbled down the stairs together, Bert's eyes full of actual shock now even as he stabbed Ben over and over again in the back and neck. Cap shouted for Donna and pushed her against the side of the stairwell just in time to keep her from getting swept up in the tangle of bloody bodies. He might have dodged as well had his hip not locked back up at just that moment. I saw the twinge of pain in his eyes as the legs straightened, pushing him directly in front of Ben and Bert at just the wrong moment. The weight of them hit the much scrawnier man and sent him flying down the stairs and toward us. Jesus, fuck! Dick screamed, smashing me out of the way with his arm and nearly knocking the wind clean out of me. I stumbled over something wet and greasy and then slid across the floor with my arms out, shaking, trying to find my balance. It was then that Agatha Comely made her appearance, slipping out from the dark spaces beneath the stairs themselves and rushing me with a carving knife. I smacked her in the face with the gun, which was satisfying if ineffective, given how much of the knife she immediately buried in my guts. I screamed, nearly lost consciousness, and then started pushing her away from me with the barrel of the gun. Her dull, stupid blue eyes locked on mine, flitting between me and the pile of bodies on the ground. I realized then that neither Donna nor Dick had noticed she'd attacked me. They were focused on Bert who was now trapped beneath Ben's body, still viciously swiping at the two of them while screeching like an addled monkey for his wife to come help him. I'll shoot, I said, pressing the gun into Agatha's eye, trying to hurt her enough to cause some retreat. I was slumped all the way against the wall, hand on hers, trying to keep her from twisting the confounded bit of steel up into my heart. Your gun doesn't have a magazine in it. She whispered, smiling at me with bloody teeth. I realized she was right. 
I hadn't reloaded the thing since Cap and Ben had their stupid little fight this morning. I screamed and pushed harder anyway, pulling the trigger as I did so and surprising myself when Agatha's eye suddenly burned bright white and the back of her head sprayed off with a resounding pop. She licked her lips twice, her remaining eye rolling in her head, and then fell off of me. I stared at the gun, which looked almost exactly the same as it had two seconds ago. No magazine, just simple black plastic and a healthy smattering of blood and brain. I dropped it and wrapped a hand around the handle of the knife in my stomach. Agatha! Bert screamed. Bring me to her. She can't go alone. She's my only sister. I watched him swipe at Donna with his knife, but the bulk of Ben remained on him, so the gesture was meaningless. His pale blue eyes were fully red now, along with most of his similarly pale blue tracksuit and almost all of his hair. Donna looked past him at Cap, whose face was slack and blue and set at a terrible angle to both the wall and his body. Ben had landed entirely on him and broken his neck. You motherfuckers, Bert screamed. Oh, you, you shits. What have you done? We are going to repopulate the earth. Dick gave him one incredibly disgusted look and then turned to find me on the ground. I smiled at him as he knelt down beside me, gingerly touching the knife and then looking around for something to fix the problem with. I pointed to a table of tools the Comleys had used for their, well, their work, I guess you'd say, and he ran over to it, picking up a pair of pliers. I shook my head and gestured to the left, where the bolt cutters were sitting. We are marked for Yith, oh you stupid idiots, Bert was saying. Donna rested her hand on Cap's eyes and shut them. Even though they popped back open a second later, that seemed to do it for her. Get this fat fuck off of me so I can kill you. You fucking parasites. Drinking at the breast of society like leeches. Leeches. You took her from me. This fat piece of shit was going to starve us all to death. Did you know that? His wife told us there was only a couple months of food left, but he's still fat, fat and healthy, leaving us to starve. The survivors. The marked. Donna cut him off by driving her oxygen tank into the side of his head. I thought she'd let him off at that and shut him up pretty good. But Donna wasn't satisfied. She hit him again and again until his skull turned lopsided and the skin beside his left eye split and pulled away from the bone. It hung like a used condom over his cheek, the bowl of it filling slowly with blood. Jesus, Donna, Dick said, handing me the bolt cutters. I shook my head and pointed to the sliver of metal between the handle of the knife and the much larger portion of steel inside my stomach. Get it off there, bud, okay? I asked. We pull it out and I'll just end up bleeding to death right here. He obliged me, and just the slight wiggling of the knife as he got the cutters into place nearly made me puke. The vibration of the steel being cut finished the job, leaving me to apologize for Dick's freshly ruined shoes. It's fine he said, laughing and looking around. He had tears in his eyes that didn't come back when he wiped them away. It's fine. You didn't clear the chamber, Donna said, picking up the gun. She pulled the magazine out of my pocket while Dick bandaged me up with what I realized were tatters of Shelley Masterson's dress. Donna slid the magazine into the chamber and pulled the slide on top of the gun, looking it over. How do I live in a neighborhood of old men who don't know how fucking guns work? She sighed and looked over at her dead husband, pulling a pack of cigarettes and a lighter out of her cardigan. She pulled her oxygen mask aside and lit a cigarette, taking a long pull and then coughing. She stubbed it out after the second drag and tossed the dead butt onto Ben's back. I didn't have the heart to look over at them. The fuck am I gonna do now? She asked herself looking around the basement. Her eyes settled on something just past Shelly's body. The hell is that? She walked in that direction, and we followed after Dick managed to pull me up off the floor. I coughed, thinking Donna's cigarette smoke hadn't faded somehow, but when I looked, I saw sprinklings of gray ash floating down the stairs. The fire, 
Dick said, and I realized he'd been looking that way too. We exchanged a glance and then followed Donna. The fire was on the hill now, probably already eating into the old abandoned Walter Place and the Comley's house. There was no going back up those stairs now, and soon, there wouldn't be any there to go back to. I touched the ridge of knife blade protruding from my stomach and thought that wasn't much of a concern to me anymore. Look at this shit, Donna said, and we did. What she'd found was an old tunnel cored right into the concrete foundation. It had an odd smoothness to it that kept me from identifying what kind of tool had made the hole, which was fairly odd given my occupation. Dick helped me get closer, and I realized what side of the house the tunnel was sunk into. Then I thought about the plastic storage container filled with blood beneath Bert and Agatha Comley's slitting station. The container marked Hanukkah. Dick, are... Were the Comleys Jewish? I asked, pointing to the bucket. Both he and Donna looked at it. The only Jewish family on the block are the Sokolovs, Dick said. We all looked into the great black expanse of the tunnel ahead of us, which could lead in only one direction, toward the Sokolovs' house. There was a sound like scratching deeper inside the tunnel, and Dick held out the votive candle in his hand. It did little to penetrate the dark painting a swatch of flickering light above the hard angle of yellow dropped onto the rounded floor of the thing by the electric lamps. Do you hear that? Dick asked. Yeah, I said. More scratching then, closer now but still impossible to see. It echoed off the walls just a little bit. I coughed, realizing then that the smoke was now almost filling the basement. I turned my head to see past Dick's shoulder. The stairwell was completely clouded over, so that even Ben, Cap, and Bert's bodies were obscured from view. Inside those white clouds danced the gentle orange of firelight. I guess we've only got one way to go, Dick said. I nodded and looked at Donna. She shrugged, adjusted the dial on her oxygen tank, and then took the first step into the tunnel. It was only then I'd noticed she'd abandoned her cane to hold the gun at her hip, pointed forward. She moved deeper inside and Cap and I joined her, just before she disappeared into the dark. The tunnels were blinding only until our eyes adjusted to the votive lights. I insisted on carrying one of the three, despite being mostly dragged by poor Dick, who had been something of a prop to most everybody in our waning party since this cursed day began. He was a strong man, despite his age and defeat occupation as a professor of English bearing me on without so much as a beleaguered breath. I did my best to hold my own weight, but my limbs, my fingers especially, had lost their dexterity. I could cling, and I could hold a candle, but even that little took all of me. The tunnel was monstrous in size for an amateur project, nearly five feet in diameter with a somewhat flattened floor that well accommodated walking. Nothing shored up the sides of the tunnel save the living rock of the West Virginia mountain into which it had been dug, upon which our little neighborhood had been built. We walked a good twenty meters, curving slightly until the yellow lights of the comely basement and any trace of them vanished completely. I ran my hand along the surface of the stone once or twice, juggling the candle awkwardly to do so and found no sense of the tools that had dug it. Something up ahead, Donna said. We stopped and, in the sinking silence that followed, heard again that soft scratching. Not so soft now, though still faint, it bounced through the tunnel around us like light from a pebble-broken pond, somehow sourceless and wavering. I found myself looking over my shoulder as much as forward, searching and failing to find a cause. Close your ears. What? Dick asked. Then he was screaming and I was blind. Not completely, of course. I saw through the lightning strike still frames of Donna's gunfire what she'd heard ahead of us. I saw that, and only that, the thing, moving with staccato gracelessness toward us through the tunnel and ringed by the darkness of the tunnel itself. Its face stood out in maddening clarity with every pistol crack, 
which in the small confines of the tunnel was no longer the satisfactory little pop I'd heard outside or even the much louder report that had preceded the death of Agatha Comely at my own hands. No, this was the fire and thunder of God let loose by mortal hands, the Promethean flame given life again in the heart of Hades. I fell to my knees, but did not look away, and I'll tell you what I saw. In the first cold strike of light, so blinding my eyes could only see a disk of white surrounded by the rainbow coronae, disinformation, at the heart of this was a blackened and feral thing, clinging to the roof of the tunnel. I could see nothing of it save the odd humanity remaining in its stretched and broken fingers. The reflective, octagonal blindness of its massive eyes. Then darkness. With the second shot, I saw the thing falling to the ground on thick legs, ending in the downturned and clawed feet of some unknown animal. Still, too, I could see the ragged wrapping of a dress all colorless for my blindness, and a wide, flat mouth falling open under the strain of its own incredible weight, then darkness. The third shot brought color to my eyes, and I could see now the blackened splits in the fair-colored flesh that had once fully enclosed the thing's face. I could see the feral maw with more clarity now as well, a clumsy thing made by some dishonest huckster of a god a laughing man with no clarity of thought for form or function. This gaping hole, as dark as the depths of the tunnel itself, was ringed with inward-facing tusks stolen from a half a dozen animals and forced into place through an unthinkable crudeness. Between these teeth flapped slivers of some thin fabric, I thought, could only be flesh. Then darkness. The final shot showed me this thing only a meter from us at best its mouth fully open, and falling so low over its chest it covered the loose and deflated breasts, spilling from the rotten old dress. There was some pain in the thing's face now, and through the simple humanity of that expression, I finally realized I was looking at Nancy Sokolov, the little mole of a woman that never left her house. Then darkness. Sound returned slowly along with pain and a great deal of confusion. Darkness had fallen fully into the tunnel with the last shot. I was laying on my side on the floor, a body on top of me, a chunk of knife in me, and suddenly somebody slapping my face. I stopped screaming and realized I could hear again. Shut the fuck up, Paul! Donna hissed. She flicked her lighter and I could see again. For a moment I panicked, realizing the body on top of me was Dick, and then sighing with relief when I realized he was fine. He jumped on top of me when the thing that had been Nancy Sokolov rushed us. Now he was frantically searching for his votive candle. Donna picked hers up, lit it, and soon enough Dick managed to find his own a short ways down the tunnel. Drop the damn thing when you fired, Dick said sheepishly, holding his hand out for Donna's lighter. She obliged him and shrugged. Her eyes were very tired. I dropped mine too, she said. There's no shame in it. I I guess not, he said, lighting the candle and handing back the plastic lighter. Donna looked it over for a while and then put it back in her cardigan. She held out her own votive, looking over the tunnel while Dick helped me to my feet. The light reflected off half a dozen small pools of blood leading away from us. Got the bitch good, Donna said shaking her head. The hell is going on here? None of us bothered trying to answer. We kept mostly silent as we made our way through the tunnel, going slowly and making as little noise as we could. It was only a few meters later that we found the branch, a much larger tunnel, nearly ten feet wide, leading down deep into the heart of the mountain. Mike Sokolov lay in a pool of fresh blood by the entrance, hands slack at his sides and his legs sprawled out ahead of him. Donna bent down beside the man, lifting his dead eyes to where we could all see. I got him, she said, pointing to holes in his neck and another in the shirt over his stomach. She looked back the way we'd came. Couple of shots I missed must have bounced all the way down here into him. She shook her head. Given what we've seen, I can't say I much feel bad about it. She stopped and picked up something on the ground beside him, holding it up where we could all see. It was a fresh four-pack of baby bottles, still sealed in plastic. 
I looked down the larger tunnel, which descended at an impressive grade, and then back the way we'd come, doing a bit of mental math. I pointed down into the somehow deeper dark. That would lead beneath the old Walter place, if you kept going, I said, not knowing what that might mean. It was all too insane. But Dick and Donna nodded, Donna taking a step ahead of us and tipping over her votive to drain the wax. Then she set the glass tube on its side and let it roll away down the grade. It bumped and skittered, but maintained a fairly straightforward course. All the way, we could see the broad pools of blood the Nancy thing had left behind. The thing clattered for a long while, casting the orb of its light against the walls before finally going out. But even still, we could hear the glass casing tap, tap, tapping its way down until it faded beyond hearing. Donna pulled her mask aside and lit a cigarette coughing into her elbow only a second after the first drag. The gun dangled from her hand when she did this, held as casually as a veteran mother holds her third child. I'm gonna go get my candle back, Donna said. We both looked at her. She tossed the baby bottles back into Mike Sokolov's lap. Donna, we need to go, Dick said. She looked at him, a severe look I'd never seen on the woman's face in my life but an expression that all the same seemed more at home there than any she'd ever given. It made me think, knowing what was in my own basement, and having seen inside a few of my neighbors what things might have lurked inside the foundations of Donna's home. Dick sighed. It's not safe down there, he said. Are you going to be okay? She chuckled. No, but that's not really any of your concern. Is it? She said this and started walking down, steadying herself on the handle of her oxygen tank roller. The pale orange cigarette butt gave off little light, but we watched it all the same until we couldn't see it anymore. Then, having no other real options, the two of us continued on down the smaller of the two tunnels. We emerged into the Sokolov's basement, which was full of mostly normal basement stuff. There were also boxes of hand-me-down children's clothes, enough for a dozen kids or more to grow into adulthood and never have to share an outfit. The only out-of-place thing was a tidy little altar built into the deepest wall of the foundation, which bore an odd symbol, like a sun setting over the horizon. When I looked at it, I felt a sort of absence in my skull, as though some thought had once lingered there but was now somehow gone. Atop the altar lay a flat silver plate and the blackened, half-chewed remnants of a human heart. There were also a few knives and some jeweled nonsense, chalices and the like, but we didn't bother looking them over. Dick tried to find something heavy to put in front of the entrance to the tunnel and, failing that, simply pushed over a few of the heavier-looking boxes. He looked at me, shrugged, and we left. It's fairly safe to say I wasn't long for this world by the time I again stood above ground. The fire had all but consumed the Walther mansion, which still looked maddeningly whole despite the conflagration surrounding it. This fire had set the comely place ablaze in a secondary fashion, and that house of cannibals was already falling into itself. I looked across the street to see if Dick's house had been spared, and it had. The burned-out remnants of our former neighbor's home, which lay between the Walther Place and Dick's home, had deterred the spread of the fire, if only for a time. Should we warn Jasper? I said, spitting an unsightly amount of blood onto the front of my shirt. It mixed with the blood from Agatha Comley's shattered skull, and I was somehow surprised how indistinguishable the two were. Dick ignored my question and started dragging me toward the end of the street. What are you doing? I asked him. We have to leave, he said, his eyes narrowed on the edge of the road. What about your husband? What about Jasper? I asked. He gritted his teeth and said nothing. I started slapping at his hands until he finally stopped. I could barely stand on my own, but I did, bent over at the waist and looking up at him. We need to go to my shed real quick, okay? He gave me a quizzical look, his eyes flitting from me to the fire, to the end of the cul-de-sac, and then back. Trust me, I said, 
And, God bless him, he did. I had him unlock the door for me. The key was simple, and so was the lock, and once they were clicked off and gone, I couldn't really take anything back. Not that I really had much in the way of time, to anyway. Jesus Christ, Paul, he said, helping me inside. I half expected him to drop me when he saw, but he, he didn't. He helped me inside to my workbench, where I leaned, dripping blood from my shirt all over a bunch of brand new, unpainted signboards. It was no great loss. The much nicer finished ones were hanging neatly to dry on the wall across from where we stood. All of these read, Best Roses, Manassas, West Virginia. You made the signs? Dick asked, looking back at me. The look of shock on his face literally made the entire day worth it. And the week preceding, really. I nodded, smiling softly, laughing a little, even though it hurt. Yep. I said. And put them out, he continued. And I dug up Shelley's roses and put them across the street, I said. And I smashed the first best roses sign and planted the next one. I grinned. Gotcha. I tried to point, but the pain was too much. Dick shook his head. Fucking why? He asked. Boredom, I said, perhaps a bit too quickly. Loneliness, I sighed. I made that first one going on 15 years ago, for Brenda. Dick's expression softened at the mention of my deceased wife's name. You remember, she used to tend that little garden in the middle of the cul-de-sac. That was all just dry dirt before she got here, but she made it beautiful. Folks never noticed because she did it for free, I guess. There's not much occasion to notice free things in this life. That is, unless they go away. I realized I was crying and wiped a tear off my eye. Then she died and the garden died. I said, nobody noticed. Nobody at all. And it all went back to dirt. To nothing. So you, what? Pranked all of us? Dick asked. I nodded. Just to pass the time, I said, up until the real joke started. I pointed out the door to the wall of flame that now hung over top us, over all the world, it seemed. That's one of mine, too, so I played it on myself as much as anything. You? Dick started, looking at the flame. Me and everybody else in this neighborhood, you know, I said. Either through action or inaction, we were all there cupping the first sparks in our hand. I coughed, and this time I didn't stop for a while, though it wasn't the smoke filling my lungs anymore. Now our baby is too big for us to handle, and he's just gonna go on growing. Dick sighed and leaned back against the table beside the other Best Roses signs. Jasper's dead, he said. I know, I told him. When he looked at me, I added, I could see it in your eyes. When Brenda died, well, let's just say it was like looking in a mirror for me. Dick laughed then, a dry, brittle sound like I'd never heard him make. He covered his mouth and looked away. He was fully crying when he turned back around, furiously, rubbing his face as though to scour away the tears. He smiled and cracked all over again, eventually gathering himself and pointing at my stomach. And now, you're, you're dying too, and everybody else? He said, running his fingers into his hair. He seemed on the verge of pulling it all out. Maybe he would, sometime after I could see. Maybe he would. He... He couldn't take it all. I hate myself so bad for it. He he did it to himself in the tub. (laughs) My God. He stumbled around my shed, finally not bothering to keep it together, bleeding all over the place even more than I was. He eventually picked up one of my signs and smashed it. I did my best to keep consciousness under the circumstances. He didn't trust me or 
Or I don't know, Dick continued. I don't know, and I never will, because he checked out on his own. He sucked in a sobbing breath, leaning on the far wall with his hand over his eyes. He was the beautiful one between us. Me, I, I'm just the one who talks about the stuff he and the other women and men like him make. I'm just an imposter. Walking around with giants and feeling giant myself, and then he goes. He goes. He cried for a while. I would have tried to hold him, but I was in no condition. Nobody was anymore. Everything was over. We were all out of chances. It's time to go, I eventually said, pointing to the respirator by the painting station I'd set up. It was nice. Too nice for the meager work I'd put it to in these last few weeks. A relic from a time when such things were needed for greater works. You take that and go. Where? He asked. Anywhere, not here, I told him. This is the only place I know for sure you can't stay. I coughed again then, and this time there was no distinguishing between the blood on my shirt that came from me or that came from anybody else. Things have a way of doing that, of coming together in the end despite your expectations. Such it was, and so it goes. Put it on and start walking. He nodded and did like I told him, looking for all the world like a spaceman when he was suited up. It would only ever help him with the smoke, not the fire. I'd realized a long time ago, along with all my peers, that there was no help for the gathering flames but distance. Prevention, perhaps. But prevention never seems to help, even when it's helping. My last request was that he take me to the dead garden in the center of the cul-de-sac. Dick brought along one of the last, best signs I'd made and laid me down in the center of all that dead earth. The fire was so bad now even his house was burning, and the street was bubbling between us and the specter of the Walther Mansion, which still seemed to live on and blasphemy inside its flaming shroud. Everything he ever wrote was in there, Dick said, placing the sign in my arms and standing to look at his own dying house. It's all gone now. That's fine, I said, grabbing his leg. There was no standing anymore. When he looked down at me, it was hard to see the humanity there behind the black plastic eyes and the tubular exclusion of the mouth. But I knew it was there. I knew it was. There's no beauty we can't find again if we hunt with honest hearts, I recited, patting the ground beside me. The dry earth rose like smoke around my bloody fingers, the dust clinging to what hadn't yet dried. That's what she told me the first time we brought this little clump of nothing back. She wasn't lying. It worked then. I gasped, a breath that hurt down to the core of me. The taste of it was dust and blood and smoke and the lingering red scent of pain. But above all that, and beneath it and inside of it, I smelled the perfume of roses there as though it had never left. It'll work again, I said, and then I said no more. My neck was too tired to hold my head, and so both settled to the earth, giving me that perfect view of the sky we were all born to inherit. No matter the smoke and grime past all that, the great blue and the dusty imperfections of the clouds, sometimes full and gray and black beyond belief, cracking wide and threatening to clean us off this little marble. No matter the clutter and the nonsense, just that sheet of honest firmament rising over all of us, there and there and there, forever, eternal. Dick knelt down and pressed his palms, still flesh, to the sides of my face and bent his mouth of plastic tubes and wires to my forehead, giving it a last kiss before standing and leaving me to my view of the sky. I thought of many things as the flames crept forward to devour me, like who might have enjoyed the fifth place at the table in the comely house, and what a woman with a half-empty oxygen tank, a gun, and a lighter might accomplish in that subterranean hell we'd left behind. But mostly I thought of a beautiful woman you've never met, 
who never gave up on dry little scraps of earth in the middle of undeserving cul-de-sacs, and who truly, truly, truly deserved the title of Best Roses, Manassas, West Virginia. Well, that was it, folks. What did you think? Have you ever played one hell of a prank on your neighbors? Have you ever discovered that the quiet old woman across the street is, in fact, some sort of demonic mole creature tunneling toward the eldritch horrors in the dark beneath your neighborhood? Let us know in the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club on Facebook. It's a place full of like-minded fans of the show who talk about horror and literature and the show and whatever else comes to mind. They and I would love to hear from you, so hop on over to Facebook and search for the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club today. While you're there, you can also follow our fan page just by searching West Side Fairy Tales. Or, if Twitter is more your speed, you can get to me at WS Fairy Tales. If you like pictures of creepy stuff, rabbits, and sometimes food, then go to Instagram and follow us at West Side Fairy Tales. If you'd like to support us monetarily, please consider heading to westsidefairytales.com slash merch and buying a souvenir of the show. We have t-shirts, hats, hoodies, and even mugs and stickers and other stuff. So head on by if you have a few bucks and want to show your support. You could also support us on Patreon, where just $1 gets you early access to all episodes. Higher tiers get you access to special episodes, super early, raw releases of the show without ads or intros, and even free merch. Contributions from listeners help this show to continue providing free, high-quality content, and we really can't thank all of you who support us enough. For those of you interested in a deeper breakdown of this month's recommendations, the novel Beloved by Toni Morrison and the movie Society, directed by Brian Usna, tune in to the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club episode that'll be dropping on the feed in two weeks. In those episodes, I provide some in-depth discussion on the recommendations some history of their creation, and talk about what they mean to me as a horror author and writer. Also, if you'd like to chat with me directly sometime, you can hop into my weekly video game streams at twitch.tv slash westsidetyler. Every Saturday night between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Eastern Time, I try to work my way through different horror-related video games. Pop on in and say hi. If you're looking for a great, scary podcast to tithe you over until our next episode, I'd like to recommend Scare You to Sleep by Shelby Scott. Each week, Shelby reads several spooky stories with added sound effects to create an immersive world of terror. Each story is read in a soothing voice that will act as a siren song to the terrifying content you will hear. The podcast has many special episodes such as True Tales, which contain users' submitted experiences. The popular Guided Nightmares are episodes made using guided meditation techniques to help you reach a level of relaxation unlike any other while you star in your own horror story. You can subscribe to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more about Scare You to Sleep at scareyoutosleep.com. Next month, we're bringing you a story that's very important to me, about a young man dealing with the grief of an impending death and the haunting of a weather-beaten old house beside a swamp. I hope you'll join me on the first Friday of December for our story, Mud of the Heart. And, until then, as always, stay safe out there. West Side Fairy Tales is written, read, scored, and produced by Tyler Bell. Episode artwork by Huey Breedlove. All content herein copyright 2019 WSF Productions, LLC. 